Greetings, <clears throat> Father Mark signing on, continuing the series on the papacy in the modern world. Moving into the reign of Pope 227, Sixtus V, who reigned from 1585 to 1590. <coughs> the conclave of 1585 took only four days to elect the successor to Gregory XIII. In doing so, they fell into a pattern often observed in papal history that conclaves often elect men of opposite temperament in alternating sequence. It's not an absolute rule, as we'll see. Sometimes there would be two popes in a row or even three popes in a row of one you know, ecclesiology uh, followed by others, but, but the alternation is, is, is clear. And the alternation is... Um, in terms of ecclesiology, meaning a theology of the church, <clears throat> between those who are mistrustful of the secular world and and see the church as uh, as like a fortress and a protection for the faithful against that, and the other the other side, the other ecclesiology would be those who uh, see the world as needing the church to uh, transform it from within. So those who uh, see that the church should become involved as much as possible in the secular world to transform it from within. <clears throat> uh, anyway, with that in mind, it, it is not surprising that the conclave elected uh, more of a, a preservationist, more of a fortress uh, mentality person uh, to follow Gregory the Thirteenth, who was more of a transformationist, participatory type. So the man the conclave of 1585 chose was uh, uh, born, uh, baptized Felice Peretti, P-E-R-E-T-T-I. <clears throat> he served as uh, Pope 227 for five years, taking the papal name Sixtus V. Peretti was born in Ancona on December 13th, 1520. That's on the eastern, that is the Adriatic Sea side of Italy. His grandfather was from Illyricum on the other side of the Adriatic Sea in Yugoslavia, uh, but had to flee when the Turks started conquering that, that area, started conquering the Balkans. As a result, you know, born to a, a refugee you know, in, in Italy, uh, Felice Peretti was born into poverty. His father was a farm worker who did not own his own land. Would... Um, uh, yeah, a day laborer, not even a sharecropper, just a, a day laborer. And Peretti himself made money as a child by tending herds uh, of pigs and goats uh, that belonged to other people, but nevertheless they would you know, pay him to, to look over him. As with Pope Pius V, who came to the attention of Dominicans by tending their sheep, so Peretti came to the attention of the Franciscans while tending their animals. This notice was facilitated by uh, a distant relative who was also a Franciscan. So the, uh, and he, so the Franciscans gave him an education. So Peretti became a Franciscan, was ordained a priest at uh, Siena, Italy, in 1547, quickly earned a reputation as a preacher. From his earliest days, his values were those of a preservationist type, of a, a fortress fortress mentality type uh, that the that the the world outside of the church is is not to be trusted <clears throat> he was a uh, he was a hard man uh, both on himself and on others uh, very disciplined very ascetic he ate and drank very little he engaged in severe spiritual disciplines and penitential practices uh, on himself in mortification of the flesh he despised heretics and, uh, and Muslims. Well, basically despised everyone who was not Catholic. The event that changed his life, <coughs> and the reason he made it into history, was an assignment to preach a series of Lenten sermons in Rome in the year 1552. This brought him to the attention of like-minded Catholics who, uh, who had all endured all through the Renaissance and beyond, and 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 believe that their ecclesiology was vindicated 
by the Protestant movement and the wars of religion, uh, which had plunged Europe into a 130-year bloodbath because of, from their perspective, because of rebellion against the, the rightful authority of the church. So these types included those we covered earlier, St. Charles Borromeo, St. Philip Neri, Cardinal Carafa, who became Pope Paul IV, uh, Michele Gislere, who became St. Pius V. They naturally welcomed Peretti into their circle and looked after his assignments. He was assigned to work with the Inquisition in Venice until the government of that city expelled him because they considered him too severe. Pope Pius V, Saint Pius V, named Peretti a bishop uh, in 1566, a cardinal in 1570, and uh, then uh, transferred him to another diocese to be uh, Bishop of Fermo in 1571. However, uh, Cardinal Bishop Peretti's philosophy, while it was aligned completely with Pope Pius V, was completely different from Pius's successor, Pope Gregory XIII. So Peretti spent Gregory XIII's reign in his diocese and was not given any higher assignments in Rome. <clears throat> and so Peretti just did his work as a, as a bishop in his diocese, and he took up as a private uh, hobby the translation of St. Ambrose from the original uh, Latin into Italian. Now, as we saw, uh, some of Gregory XIII's policies, in particular his bungling of the government of the Papal State, proved to be a disaster. And uh, there was a complete breakdown of effective of government, uh, of, of public order. Now, since uh, this rendered the city of Rome no longer safe, the cardinals voted for a man they believed could and would restore order, stability. So they voted for Peretti because he was a hard man. And he took the name of Sixtus as Pope to honor the last, he was a Franciscan, so to honor the last Franciscan to be Pope, who was Sixtus IV. In terms of uh, governance, <clears throat> Gregory XIII's mismanagement had reduced the Papal States to a condition of total lawlessness. It was beyond even a crime wave. Trade was impossible because of roving bands of, of heavily armed thugs. This wrecked the economy. People who could not grow their own food either took the risk of running away, which subjected them to being killed on the road, or took up arms themselves. Sixtus V, though he was 65 years old when elected pope, had the strength and endurance built from a lifetime of asceticism. He recruited an army of mercenaries, condottieri, you know, as, as we, uh, we uh, it, it, of, of Swiss and Spanish mercenaries, and in effect invaded his own papal states. It took two years of fighting, brutal fighting. He captured and executed 12,000 brigands, uh, bandits leaving their bodies hanging along the major roads to let people know that the 13 years of anarchy and, and Gregory XIII's incompetence was over. It is estimated that another 27,000 were killed, and as this amounted to an internal civil war in the Papal State. But by the time it was done, the Papal States and the city of Rome were at peace and totally secure. The Spanish ambassador wrote home that he believed after Sixtus's work was done, it would be possible for a young girl to walk alone from one end of the papal state to the other, carrying a bag of gold, and still be completely safe. With peace restored, commerce resumed and the economy recovered. Pope Sixtus continued to live like a, a friar, like a, 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 a very severe Franciscan friar, so expenses were drastically reduced. Uh, he was not the kind of person that entertained or, or held you know, large public functions. Uh, when ambassadors came, you know, other kinds of popes like Gregory the Thirteenth would, would have a you know a banquet and invite, you know, hundreds of people and all. Sixtus, no, okay. Ambassador comes, you come into the office, 
what do you have to say? Okay, fine. This is my response. You know, have a nice day. By the time of his death, Sixtus left a papal treasury with three million gold pieces. That, that's actual gold coins. And 1,600,000 silver pieces, silver coins. He followed this up, uh, his, his suppression of his restoration of public order, with uh, massive restorations. Uh, he built a new aqueduct to supply Rome with clean drinking water. He opened up uh, streets, uh, massive boulevards linking the, the major basilicas in Rome, facilitating travel, repair, uh, travel and uh, commerce. He repaired roads and bridges to facilitate trade and movement. So uh, he certainly never spent money on, you know, on frivolous things like entertainment. But he was not—he was not just a miser. He did spend money, but it was all on this kind of stuff, practical things, that that made a real difference in people's lives. Infrastructure, as we'd say today. <clears throat> Further, um, on December twentieth, fifteen eighty-five, in terms of internal church governance, six, Pope Sixtus commanded that every bishop in the world visit Rome every five years, once every five years, to report in person on the condition of the diocese. This requirement remains to this day. He's the one that instituted. So these are the ad limina visits. So limina, L-I-M-I-N-A, is the Latin word for threshold. Uh, and so ad limina is to the threshold. So the, so the, the bishops, the ad limina visits, and when the bishops go... You know, it's kind of an, an idiomatic way of saying it, but like the bishops go to the threshold, the door, you know, the door of the Pope's, you know, room, you know, uh, and, and then the Pope accepts them in and then they give their report. And that still happens. December 3rd of the following year, 1586, <clears throat> in uh, a papal bull uh, titled Postquam Verus, he uh, fixed the number of the, uh, the number of seats in the College of Cardinals to 70, 70, 70. And that number was not exceeded. It was not changed until the 20th century, Pope John the Twenty Third, who was elected in 1958. So that's the, the impression that Pope Sixtus made. You know, he did this, and, you know, the ad limina was never changed. The College, College of Cardinals numbers were not changed for, what, 400 years, almost 500 years. <clears throat> um, February 11th, 1588, uh, he, uh, uh, he reformed the Curia. Curia just means council. So the, uh, the senior council uh, of the Pope, or the cabinet, to you know, use a, a secular analogy. Uh, the papal bull that did this was Immensa Eterni Dei. In order to ensure that the cardinals uh, would never again wield excessive influence in the church, <clears throat> because of the you know the, the the pattern that we've seen you know for centuries that um, and not many times these cardinals were just younger sons of aristocratic families and therefore would use that power for the benefit of the like if if it ever came where they had to choose between the benefit of their family and the benefit of the church they would choose the family so he divided responsibilities in the curia among fifteen separate congregations or departments as you know to use a secular analogy. And that remained largely intact until Vatican II, which met from 1962 to 1965. Uh, so these uh, departments were, first, the Inquisition. It was still called that. Later would be called the Holy Office, and today is called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Second, the Signatura, which is the, uh, the Church's Supreme Court. Third, the Congregation for the Establishment of Churches. Uh, now that churches that that uh, the, the diocese that means you know establishment of new dioceses. Fourth, a congregation of rites and ceremonies. Uh, fifth, the index of forbidden books. Sixth, the congregation for the Council of Trent. That we saw when Trent ended. The reason there was no spirit of the Council of Trent is that the documents itself concluded by stipulating that any questions about implementation would be sent to Rome and the Pope would decide. And so this congregation was created to receive, you know, the mail, so to speak, of, of any containing any questions about how to implement Trent. Seven, the Congregation of Regulars, 
I know that doesn't sound right, but uh, that's in the the Latin root. Regula means rule. Uh, so uh, these are religious. Today we'd say the congregation of religious, meaning religious orders, those that are bound by a particular rule. Eighth, the congregation of bishops. Ninth, the congregation of the uh, the Vatican Press, uh, wh which that means the printing press, and in, in their you know that in, in that in their context. Um, uh, tenth, the congregation of the Anona, and that was for provisioning of the city of Rome and the province of the Papal State. So this was uh, more dealing with the, the temporal affairs of the Papal State, the acts, the practicalities of government. Uh, Eleventh, the congregation of, of the Navy. <laughs> That's the, uh, uh, Twelfth, the congregation of public welfare, and uh, that means the, the charity or you know, the uh, Beneficence Fund. Uh, the 13th, the uh, Congregation of the Sepienza, and that referred to, at the time, that referred to the Seminary of Rome. 14th, the Congregation of Roads, Bridges, and Waters, which, again, that, that's dealing more with, uh, not more, dealing with uh, the, the infrastructure, the, the, some of the practicalities, practicalities of, of governance of the Papal State. And 15th, the Congregation of State Consultations, that means the foreign power policy, dealing with uh, diplomats. <clears throat> In terms of uh, teaching, Pope Sixtus felt no need to issue any particular teachings on doctrine as the Council of Trent, in his mind, had settled such matters. And that was, you know, I mean, he was alive when Trent, he, he didn't attend because he was too young, but so it was, it was a living, living memory. But there are two actions during his reign that do fall under the category of teaching in the sense of, of uh, theology. And so this, uh, you know, uh, brings us back to France, which we covered in earlier uh, episodes. The, um, on September 9th, 1585, he, he excommunicated Henry of Navarre, uh, which brings us back to France. Uh, as we saw, because uh, we covered the French Wars of Religion, France had been ruled by the Valois dynasty since 1328. Uh, they uh, uh, created by uh, uh, King Philip VI, or Philippe VI, who was a grandson of King uh, Philippe III, but through a cadet branch of the Capetian dynasty. So Philip VI did have Capetian blood, but because it was from a, you know, a subordinate, from a younger son, in other words, uh, uh, from a, in this case, a grandson, a younger son had a son, so it was from a grandson of Philip III. So even though ultimately he was a Capetian, but because it was two steps removed, or three, one, two, three, three steps removed, uh, he's considered to be a, a new, you know, found a new dynasty, the Valois dynasty, V-A-L-O-I-S. So time passed. By the reign of Sixtus V, France was ruled by Henri III, Henry III, who, as we saw, uh, died and had no children follow him. So uh, adhering to French dynastic practice, the legitimate heir to the throne would be the eldest male of the closest cadet branch of the Valois dynasty, which turned out to be the Bourbon family, House Bourbon, descended from another cadet branch, in this case the sixth son, of Louis the Ninth, Saint Louis, King of France, and he was named Robert or Robert, Robert de Clermont, who had married the heiress of the the House Bourbon, the Bourbon, the Bourbon family, in 1278, and then the house continued. During the reign of Pope Sixtus V, the head of the family of House Bourbon was Antoine de Bourbon, whom we've already met in a previous episode lived from 1518 to 1562. He married, entered into a political marriage, so, you know, the, the old feudalism problem. He married the Queen of Navarre uh, and had the title King Consort. So the, uh, the throne of France, therefore, would pass to his eldest son, and that was Henri or Henry of Navarre, who lived from 1553 to 1610. The problem was that Henri of Navarre was a Protestant of the Huguenot variation, which means a French Calvinist. He had fought with the Huguenots during the French Wars of Religion and had led, actually led troops in battle that had killed Catholics. 
uh, after the uh, after the Saint Bartholomew's Day massacre, when the Catholics hit back, Henri Henry of Navarre converted to Catholicism to save his life, and then when he escaped France, returned to Cal- the Calvinist form of Protestantism, which the French, which the Huguenots followed. So as the reigning Valois king aged and neared his death, it was obvious that this Protestant was going to become king of France. And in doing so, there was every expectation that the wars of religion would start again. And we spent a great deal of time in previous uh, videos talking about that. So, you know, that, that was not a desirable outcome. I mean, even the Protestants didn't really want that. Now, they did want to control the country. I mean, they wanted to win. <clears throat> but the Catholics uh, didn't know what to do. As two teachings of the church seemed to be to, to collide, one teaching would be the duty of Catholics to obey legitimate authority, which in this case would be their sovereign. And according to the law of the time, the dynastic law of the time, Henri of Navarre would be the legitimate heir. Opposed to that, or seemingly opposed to that, on the other side was the the duty, the Catholic duty, to preserve the Catholic faith. And, and given the history of the wars of religion since the Protestant movement occurred, there was, there was legitimate fear that a Protestant king would, uh, would outlaw Catholicism or at least you know, steal church property, do the vandalism, all the stuff that happened in, in Germany and, and other countries where the Protestant movement emerged. So this was on the desk, so to speak, of Pope Sixtus V. Now, he was the type that he saw no dilemma. You know, if there's, if there's a question of, of political considerations versus ecclesial considerations, well, the church is the only thing that really mattered to him. So he cared nothing for politics or political implications. So he simply excommunicated Henry of Navarre on September 9th, 1585, and declared that French Catholics were not obliged to obey him. So relieving them of the, 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 uh, the conscience, the dilemma of conscience, of, uh, of the first... Of the, of the you know, regular Catholic teachings that we are obliged to obey legitimate authority. So he said, no, he's, well, he's not a legitimate authority, so you're not obliged to follow him. This triggered uh, denunciations of the Pope for being a tyrant, for, being, for violating the ancient Gallican liberties. And as we've seen, there was no such thing. It was a fiction invented to justify the claims of erroneous Gallican ecclesiology, uh, which meant the, na- the National Church ecclesiology, that had already been declared heretical. Now, Pope Sixtus was not concerned in the slightest by such protest. He declared the truth, took the action he deemed appropriate, and anyone who didn't like it was free to leave the church. The reigning Catholic king of France, Henri III, Henry III, uh, lived until August 2, 1589. That was the very end of Pope Sixtus' reign, so we'll have to wait until the next reign to see what happened. The significance of this episode is that it is completely consistent with his mindset, his preservationist mindset, sort of the fortress ecclesiology, um, as Pius V had done the same, done the same thing regarding England uh, with Elizabeth I of England. And um, so that, that's just that, that style of, of governance, of, of teaching. Second, uh, that fits within the realm of theological teaching. Uh, on May 2nd, 1590, uh, there was a, a revision of the Catholic Bible, the Standard Bible, which was the Vulgate Bible, meaning the, the, the Latin, St. Jerome's Latin translation of the Bible. Well, Pope Sixtus wanted a new edition of the Vulgate Bible. However, he was, he was impatient with the slow progress being made by the translators. Now, he, as we saw, he had worked on the writings of St. Ambrose for years, so he felt that this equipped him to be a translator, so he simply took over the work himself. <laughs> he produced his own edition of the Vulgate on May 2nd, 1590. Now, by his own, I mean like the one he personally made, not just, you know, when he commissioned and then approved. And that's what, you know, May 2nd, 1590. So in this, we can see a... a uh, one of the weaknesses of the sort of the fortress ecclesiology approach. Uh, everyone was too frightened of Sixtus to tell him that his edition was filled with grammatical errors. Uh, even one of his senior theologians, Cardinal Robert Bellarmine, who's now a saint, a doctor of the church, 
was so petrified of Pope Sixtus that he said nothing, even though he was afraid that the Protestants would use the poor edition as yet another reason to ridicule the church and denounce it for being indifferent to the Bible. So this is another problem, and we'll, we'll see this solved in a, a future papal reign. In terms of sanctification, uh, the previous Franciscan pope, <clears throat> Sixtus IV, had canonized the medieval Franciscan superior general, St. Bonaventure, in 1482. And uh, we covered St. Bonaventure in the medieval course. And there's a separate playlist for that. Uh, Sixtus V, also a Franciscan, uh, named this same St. Bonaventure a doctor of the church in 1588. In this, Sixtus made uh, his only departure from the general pattern of uh, uh, modern uh, of preservationists. Of the, uh, uh, and most often they've been Thomist and therefore amenable to Aristotle. But Sixtus uh, liked Bonaventure, so was an Augustinian, which is ultimately derived in, uh, from uh, Plato, or at least used Platonic uh, philosophical categories to, uh, to present uh, the rational aspects of Catholic theology. <clears throat> St. Bonaventure uh, believed that correct theology was not possible without correct metaphysics. And correct metaphysics was not possible without the supernatural light of faith. Pagan philosophers were therefore not, in his estimation, reliable sources of philosophical discourse. He did acknowledge that some of them, such as Plato, had arrived at some correct principles using natural reason. However, they were simply not necessary as guides after the revelation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Okay, general developments. Uh, the uh, Spanish Armada, which brings us to May through August of 1588, although it, had, it took years to do. Well, anyway, okay. So Pope Sixtus V sent money and encouragement to King Philip II of Spain, whom we met previously, for what together they refer to in their correspondence as the Enterprise of England but which history refers to as the Spanish Armada. During the summer of 1588, 130 Spanish ships carrying 30,000 troops attempted to sail from Portugal north to the Netherlands in order to join forces with Catholic troops in Belgium, which, who would be loaded onto barges, and then both groups would then invade England cross the English Channel, invade England to do regime change, to, to overthrow Elizabeth I, the Protestant Queen of England, and um, install a Catholic monarchy. And they would also uh, halt the, the, the activity, which they regarded as criminal, of English privateers against Spanish, uh, the Spanish fleet and Spanish commerce. This was the culmination of 20 years of hostility between England and Spain. American history books, with their English Protestant viewpoint, treat as heroes the English sea captains, such as Francis Drake, John Hawkins, Martin Frobisher. They were called in their own day privateers, uh, which is piracy, uh, meaning that, you know, stealing other ships violently. But uh, they were licensed by the English government, so they were not part of the English Navy. They were private citizens, uh, private mariners, who received a license from the English government and, uh, in return for a percentage of the stolen goods. And as we, uh, the English, by this point, had a technological advantage over the Spanish in that uh, English naval architecture uh, developed along a different trajectory. And they they uh, developed smaller, faster, more maneuverable ships as opposed to the large Spanish galleons. As a result, the English routinely emerged from naval uh, confrontations as victors over the Spanish. They raided routinely Spanish colonies in the New World, uh, which were, of course, themselves stolen property from the indigenous people. But they escalated uh, their raiding, the English escalated their raiding to armed intervention in the Netherlands, 
which was undergoing its own war of religion, which we covered previously. <clears throat> now, Philip II regarded the Netherlands, and, or, and remember, the Netherlands in their context refers to what is now both Holland and Belgium. All that together was considered the Netherlands. And uh, Philip II considered that his, by right of inheritance, from his father, uh, Charles V. <clears throat> and uh, finally, the, the English privateers further escalated by attacking the Spanish mainland. A uh, famous raid, uh, Francis Drake raided the city of Cadiz uh, in 1587, which was a clear act of war You know that, that no self-respecting country could tolerate. So it's a long background to the Spanish Armada. But as it turned out, there was no single battle. Uh, the English ships constantly attacked the Spanish formation on its edges and always eluded being enveloped by the superior numbers. This was followed or interspersed with a series of storms in the English Channel that sufficed to disperse the Spanish Armada and render it militarily useless. And most of the ships were lost, so the invasion of England never occurred. After this, Spain did remain a great power for a long time because of all the wealth that it, it uh, extracted from the New World in terms of gold and silver mines. But this defeat in 1588 marked the, the zenith and, their, and then the beginning of the decline of their supremacy, of, uh, of Spanish supremacy, and correlatively the beginning of the emergence of England as a naval power in the Western world. Pope Sixtus V died two years later, August 27, 1590, uh, of malaria, two months before his 70th birthday. So far, he is the last pope to take the name Sixtus. He was followed by Pope Gregory the Fourteenth, and it is to his reign that we will turn next. Thank you for your attention. The session is adjourned. <clears throat>